Um, good. Okay, so uh, let's start today class. Uh, uh, what did we cover so far again? Talk about game theory, the motivations, lots of equilibrium or settlements. Then we talk about this kind of uh, search trees that was important things. We went to auctions and we covered auctions and we and uh, both offline and online auctions. As I mentioned, online auction is essentially the uh, real gem here because of lots of these trillion dollar companies are based on essentially online auctions. Lots of them are advertisement auctions. Last but not least, uh, we are coming to the coalition game theory. That's another very important concept in game theory that we will discuss uh, today and in the next session. And interestingly, uh, this is we talk about Shapley value and maybe this session or the next session. These are the concepts that now has been used, for example, at ML. This is a, something if you work on the ML, it is called Shap value that they are doing that to uh, using the concept of coalition game theory. Essentially, they are understanding that if you are doing essentially feature engineering, which feature would be more important? And this is the fair share of essentially a feature. And that based on that concept, there's a Shapley value. And this is the Shapley value of in machine learning is so that we watch which features are more important is very common things actually in practice in industry. So and this comes from this one. And that was actually one of the beautiful things that I uh, have uh, uh, observed and it's like the, I wish I had that paper as well. That was actually a good paper uh, that they are introduced relating game theory to MLSH. But anyhow, what is the coalition game theory? So uh, coalition game theory is transferable utility. Generally consider uh, a set of agents and you want that, uh, essentially, you define the rules in such a way, or you want to understand if there are some underlying rules that which coalition forms essentially. And then you can also talk about that if there are this kind of coalition, how do they divide the payoff among themselves? So generally, it is not concerned with how the agents make uh, uh, individual choices within a coalition, how do they coordinate, or any such detail. So it's like, okay, these are the things they have some, uh, they have a limited, essentially, lens inside the groups. You just define something and say, better which coalition for? And we have this kind of transferable utility assumption that the payoffs to a coalition may be freely redistributed among its members. So payoff essentially is the uh, things that we will uh, get it, so somehow kind of profit in some sense uh, or utility, and then it can be freely distributed among the agents. And as long as there is some kind of universal currency like money essentially, then it can we can just do this transferable say this is the amount of money that we are giving. Uh, and all we are talking is that uh, each mm, coalition that you are considering is that there's a single number that I'm giving to you. So this is the money. If this coalition forms, then this is the payoff, this is the money that you will get. Okay, so let's make it a bit more formal. Good. A coalition game with transferable utility is a pair G, N, and this one you can say V or you can no is another, like essentially quick name for it. So I'll say that, uh, so I may use both of them. Uh, Prefer to use no, but sometimes I may use v if I'm not careful. So uh, here G is equal to N, N is the number of agents. It's, these are essentially the set of players, one to N. And then nu, which is a function from 
2 to the n to r. Associate with each coalition, each subset of agents, a real value payoff nu of s. That is the co uh, that the coalition member can distribute among themselves freely. This is uh, just uh, essentially formalizing the previous slide that I have. So it is essentially for each subset, I am just giving some uh, new function. What is the what is the payoff for this set of players? And this new, it can be, I mean, the size of that is exponential because it's true to say for two to, and this is, the, uh, this is the typical things that for such kind of function, we may consider an oracle. So this is the thing that I, so where did you hear Oracle before? Like the famous things. We heard actually, if you have seen the movie Matrix, there is an Oracle there. It's going under. That's essentially the same Oracle. Uh, so uh, this is the like uh, a, a typical thing that you will ask that essentially. You don't know how is it encoded or something because the size can be exponential if you want to do that. And there is no rule that you can compress it. But you can say always there is an oracle. And generally you will consider the number of calls to this oracle you try to minimize for this kind of function. If when we talk about the computational issues. So nu is a, called a characteristic function. And we have this assumption that nu of empty set is equal to zero. So a coalition's payoff is also called its worth. How much does it worth? And game theory is normally used to answer this coalition game theory. Which coalition will form? That's the thing that I mentioned. And uh, uh, if this coalition form, how should that coalition divide its payoff among its member to be fair? This fairness is something that we will talk more uh, about it when we talk about Shapley value. So generally, sorry, that is like. <clears throat> uh, generally, one thing that uh, happens, we would like to get the grand coalition to be formed. What's the meaning of that? It means that all the agents we want to be in the, uh, essentially in the final coalition. And this is important. Uh, why? Because I think lots of these, they want, essentially they want to form a game that lots of people essentially participating in this game. Uh, or if possible, all of them essentially. And sometimes this is a required. So that's the thing that we want to form the rules of the game such that everyone essentially participates. And this answer to tools that how do we divide it? Uh, uh, is essentially we try to somehow divide again this payoff such that we as fair as possible, hopefully the grand coalition form such that everyone participates in the game. Good. And, and by the way, uh, this is important. Uh, yes. Is that the grand coalition? Um, we hope that it happens at the end of the game. Uh, I mean, this is a, somehow essentially we consider one shot game that we want to put it this one, and we essentially argue that when the decision happens, the grand coalition happens. In practice, there might be a stages, but we are talking mainly in the final part of the game. So in that sense, it is one shot. But in the middle, yeah, there are some negotiation, et cetera, as well. But the final thing is that which coalition, what are the people who essentially form this coalition? But anyway, uh, uh, coalition game theory is another important thing. There are lots of important concepts that we are introducing here. And these concepts are used very widely, essentially, in ML game theory and others. So it is very important that you know these definitions. And they are very useful. So in that sense, not only the concept of coalition game theory is important, but these concepts that we are talking about, for example, this concept of an oracle that exists, you will see in lots of essentially ML as well. When we talk about uh, some modular functions or convex function, et cetera. Uh, 
Mm. Good. So that is one thing that is like some kind of oracle that it exists. Uh, let me see an. Uh, let me give you an example. This is the called. Uh, this is a voting game. Uh, consider a parliament that ha contains one hundred representatives from four political parties: A, forty-five representatives; B, twenty-five; C, fifteen; and D, fifteen. Now, they are going to vote on whether to pass a one hundred million spending bill. And then how much of it should be controlled by each party? That we will talk more essentially when we talk about fair division. So there are two important things. What is the coalition that forms and how do they distribute this payoff among themselves? And these two are related or correlated actually, because if you make a fair rule, then you can make sure that essentially you maximize the participation. And this is like generally this is the case. So lots of these things. If the people think that there is something for them, that's exactly the thing. So you want to get a great participation, I don't know, in some of the meetings that you have it essentially among some student organization, etc. The idea is that you can make the rules such a way that everyone thinks that oh, there is something for them and it is fair. Then you make essentially more people coming, essentially, you try to form some kind of grand coalition or a coalition which is as large as possible. That's the whole idea of game theory. Now, uh, in, this, uh, in this game, they need a majority. It means at least 51 votes to pass legislation. If the bill doesn't pass, then every party gets zero. If they pass it, they will get it 100 million here or like one. So this is like, let's essentially say it in terms of formal case. Uh, so here, the set of agents are N essentially, there are 100 members. So this is like say Senate, for example. Uh, then a, a set of winning coalitions, W, the winning coalition <laughs> is a subset of this two to the N. So in this example, all coalition that have enough votes to pass the bill. Uh, nu of s is equal to one for each coalition s essentially is a winning coalition then it gets one or you can say that 100 million these are the same and zero otherwise so any coalition that at least they have 51 votes then they are good. i say if we have this assumption if you are at a you are all going according to a vote so all the a votes will be the same b votes and these are the same. But these are at the same time at the individual people. But their votes essentially are just. Wait, what does V mean again? A, a nu. This is nu essentially. A, a, a nu of S is the payoff. He said that if uh, if the, this set of people essentially is a winning set, then it is one, otherwise it is zero. Okay, so it's not how much each individual player gets. No, how much no, 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 not, we have not discussed that. They want, right? No, we have not discussed that one. We will discuss that later. So far, we are just talking about the grand coalition, uh, like the whole things. We, we are talking later about the individual payoff. Okay, so this is how much the entire coalition gets. Yes. Okay. Uh, that, that makes sense. Okay, so these are the important definitions that I... Uh, mentioned that, I mean, you should know these are super important for anything that nowadays you are working. Uh, super additive games. So we, we are talking here, talk about super versus sub additive. And the only thing is that this is super means, for example, greater than or equal, sub means less than or equal. And if we don't say that, just say additive. So there are three terms that we are using essentially here. We talk about the... <clears throat> So we talk about super, uh, so super sub, and just uh, nothing essentially. So nothing means super means essentially greater than or equal. Sub means less than or equal. If you don't say nothing, it means equal. General. So a coalition game uh, G of n and nu, but right, this essentially two things it is decided is super additive. If the union of 
to this joint coalition is worth at least the sum of the members. So it means that if there are two S and T and they have zero intersection, then nu of S union T is greater than nu of S plus nu of T. This is called super additive. If this is less than or equal, it is called sub additive. It will, uh, this game is called additive or inessential. This is like the game theory version, but more additive is more popular one. If it is the case that these are equal. So these are these three things that I have mentioned, super sub and this. If you don't say anything, essentially means that they are equal. Uh, so let's see the voting example. In the voting example, I want to say that the voting example is an example of super additive things. So essentially is that when you, what is the idea here? This idea of super additive is that when the people join, then they gain more essentially. Overall is more for all of them. So, and it is somehow, this is the intuition here that if you consider, for example, and note that the majority wins, that is very important. Um, here, uh, consider uh, this thing. So uh, here, if there are two sets, S and T, so why it is essentially super added? Consider two sets S and T which have an empty set. So if both of them are, the value of both of them are zero, it means that they are not majority. Of course, then union also at least would be zero, but might be one actually become majority. So this is the case. So in that case, actually W of ST, which is greater than or equal to zero is uh, greater than or equal to some of these ones. Now, if they are uh, essentially empty, uh, the intersection is empty and W of S is equal to one, then we know the W of T should be zero. Why? Because of the majority. If one group is 51, then the other one would be less than 50. So that would be not the majority. In this case, we know that, of course, W of S and T is equal to one. But again, we have, for both cases, we have these equations. And this is another interesting thing. If G is a super additive, uh, essentially, the grand coalition always has the highest possible payoff. Why? So, because if you consider any uh, S which is not equal to N, we know that uh, uh, nu of N, it is greater than nu of S and nu of N minus S. N minus N and S, these are disjoint. And of course, if we are assuming that the nu is greater than or equal to zero, so this is greater than nu of s. So grand coalition uh, payoff is always greater than any other subset of it. That of any subset of it. And again, uh, one interesting thing here you notice, if in this case, in this uh, parliament case, if we didn't have the majority, if we have just say 50% is enough to win, then, then it was not a super additive case. Why? Because in this case, it could be the case W of S is equal to one, W of T is equal to one because both of them are 50% and they don't have any intersection. Then W of ST, of course, it would be equal to one. But in this case, W of ST is, S, like ST means uh, S union T. S union T is actually is not greater than or equal to uh, nu of s plus nu of t because then it would be one which is not greater than one plus one. so essentially this nu of uh, s union t greater than equal to nu of s plus nu of v nu of t is not happening if you are getting it instead of just but if you change a little bit the rule say so that 50 percent is enough then it is not super additive and as you can see that this is actually this is exactly gives the intuition in this case the people they don't necessarily are motivated to get a, essentially all people involved because then with 50 percent you can win the game essentially so there is not motivation to game to form a grand coalition just so we're saying that the is uh, 
Yes, but I'm saying if the, that the rule was that if if the you will win if it is 51 percent majority. But I'm saying that if we don't say that uh, don't say that a strong majority, we just say weak majority, which is 50 percent essentially. Then it is not the super I think you might have said this. Is it the hence like mu as you need to be? Am I really not sure? Because one is greater than minus one, but two is not. Yeah, so here, as I mentioned, so in this case that S and T are two, 50%, 50%, they are disjoint. In this case, nu of S is equal to one, nu of T is equal to one, and nu of S union T is still one, but one is not greater than this, so this does not exist. Good. Uh, is it there are some way for some game to have both super additive and sub additive properties? So say there are three teams. If two teams team up together, they can get more. Or if the third team teams up again with them, they end up getting less than they would have gotten if they just went separately. Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, uh, you can think about it. I mean, uh, I mean, I cannot just create. Top of my head, because you need to check this one for all S and T. So it might be correct for some S and T are correct, but that should be correct for all S and T. And that's the thing that you need to check with, see whether it works or not. Okay, but it is possible for something like that to happen. I mean, like you need to create it. I mean, I don't know the exact constraint that you will put it. You should see and create such an example that whether it is possible or not. Okay. Uh, do all coalitions games have to be super or sub additive? No, uh, the games can be. I mean, sub. You see, just some property of the game. I mean, there is no need to be. I mean, it can be the same for. I mean, it, it can be. You can have a combination for some sets. If they go together, then they becomes better. For some games, if you go together, it becomes like for some games. If the people go together, then it may become better. For some, it may become. Worse, and you can think about it. If there are two people who are working nicely together, if they come as a team, then the whole profit will be better for this one. But if two people that are conflicting people, if they team up, then essentially the situation becomes worse. Essentially, so not you know, surely not the case that you can have a combination of sub additive or super additive constraints in any game, and then it is none of them. Uh, So uh, this is something that is mentioned. I mean, as I mentioned, in general, it is the case. If the game is super additive, it uh, it somehow incentivizes for the people to form larger coalitions and get essentially more people involved. Uh, yeah, that's some kind of essentially the people uh, can work together. Now, uh, another game which is important is the constant sum game. So uh, these are, again, some of the inter inter important terms. So what is a constant sum game? Uh, so um, G is a constant sum if words of grand coalition is equal to the sum of the words of any two coalition that partition N. I say, uh, what is the definition is that the definition is Uh, nu of s plus nu of n minus s is equal to nu of n of s for any s. Uh, now note that every additive game is a constant sum game. Why? This is the additive means that nu of s plus nu of n minus s, they don't have any intersection, is equal to the nu of the union, which is equal to nu of n. So additive games are constant sum games. But not every constant sum game is additive. And you, this is a, I mean, you can think about it as an example. That's actually a very good exercise to create something which is, you can have, there is, I mean, you can have a few, eight, n can be a small, there is no need to be large. Game that it is constant sum, but it is not additive. And in some of the additive, I mean, the intuition is that additive is more general because they said that for everything, not only for those S's, not only for S and N minus S, 
but it's for everything. And that's somehow the intuition that you should use it to create this counterexample. That not every constant sum game is additive. Uh, good. Another thing which is very important, so these are the two important concepts that we are hearing a lot. Uh, this is uh, this kind of uh, additivity or subadditive, superadditive. The, another one is the concept of submodular, supermodular, and you can say modular as well. So again, we have this concept, this three things that we talk: sub, uh, super, and we, we say nothing. So G is a convex. I mean, sometimes it is called convex, but submodular nowadays is very famous thing, especially in the area of also machine learning. Uh, Supermodular and submodular, both of them, but I feel super submodular even more. So a G is a convex or sub supermodular if for all S and T a nu of S. So there we don't have any intersection constraints that they don't need to be intersected. So nu of S union T um, plus nu of S intersection T is equal to nu of S plus nu of T. So this is called submodular, supermodular. If it is less than or equal, it is called submodular. So less than or equal is called submodular. And this is a very famous thing, essentially, as I mentioned, the community of machine learning. So uh, one thing which is uh, important, uh, this is another important definition. This definition might be a bit harder to work on it. There is another definition which is actually much easier to work with it. You can show that uh, these four, and these two are equivalent. That if you have this one, that for uh, all i, i is a player essentially in n, but and for all s and t, uh, such that s is a subset of t, and t does not contain i. That's the meaning of it. But the T does not contain I. If you are adding I to T, which is a larger set, this is called marginal payoff. The marginal payoff is greater than or equal to the marginal payoff if you are adding I to the smaller set. So this is the whole concept of supermodular. And again, the submodular is exactly the reverse of that. We have this one. This, if it is less than or equal, it becomes the submodular. So again, the, the definition of supermodular is that if you have S and T and some I that I doesn't belong to T and S is a subset of T. If you add I to T, the marginal payoff, so this is called marginal payoff, The marginal payoff is greater than or equal to the, the marginal payoff if you add it to T is greater than or equal to the marginal payoff if you add it to F. What is the idea? This is somehow similar to super additivity. It encourages more people essentially to join to the larger one. Because uh, if this is a larger set, I come there, I can contribute more. And again, in the super, super modular is exactly the reverse of that, is that if you come to a larger set, your contributions would be less essentially, your individual contribution. Why, for example, if you join to a, like a larger crowd, probably, I mean, your areas, the areas that you are expertise in it are, it's somehow covered by others, most probably, Compared to the case that you are joining a smaller set, then in that case it will be a submodular. And why these are equivalent? Again, this is another good exercise that actually this is one of the things that helps you a lot to understand and work with the proofs. And I mean, you can just do that, and at the end of the day, you can ask ChatGPT or search on the web if you couldn't find it. But uh, it would be good to try to prove it. Why is these two are equivalent? And so one other important thing, how you may define lots of time that they are defining this way, submodular or supermodular. But the one definition that you need to really work with it is this one. This definition is much, much easier, essentially, to work with it. Because the intuition is much easier. That if, you, uh, if I add i to the larger set, 
the marginal payoff would be higher compared to a smaller thing. That is for super uh, super modular. For sub modular, it would be the reverse essentially. But if you are doing it to some percent to the larger set, the marginal payoff would be less than or equal to the case that of uh, when you add it to a smaller set. And again, uh, you can have the modular. Modular means that these two are equal. So uh, note that for all S and T, uh, so what was the definition of super, super additive? He said that if two S and T, if the intersection is equal to empty set, then nu of S union T is greater than nu of S plus nu of T. Good. So uh, in this case, Uh, so in some sense, uh, uh, you can see this is somehow a stronger. So in the, uh, so you know that the nu of S union T already is greater than nu of S plus nu of uh, T. And you can actually prove that this kind of super additivity. Generally, super additivity is a stronger version of uh, submodularity. So, uh, super additivity is like a stronger constraints comparing to the super modularity. Uh, for submodular, also, the people may use uh, concave. So this is the other form that they are uh, using essentially. And mm, I'm good. Um, professor, for the equivalent part underneath. Yeah. Um, is is that essentially just saying that uh one of this the larger subset uh is always going to have the greater payoff? No, he says that I mean if you add something to the larger payoff, the marginal would be larger. And the marginal is the side of the equation that's greater yeah. than or I mean uh, uh, this is the this is also this is another one that the people are uh, using it. So uh, we call it essentially if for s. Uh, subset of t. If we have nu of s less than or equal to nu of t, then it is this this is called monotone. <laughs> so uh, the monotonicity is another thing that if it's a larger set, always uh, nu is larger. Uh, sometimes you can have submodularity, supermodularity with monotonicity or without monotonicity. So monotonicity does not imply from this definition. And this is actually, a, like for example, a good study of, uh, like again, monotone submodular function versus non-monotone submodular function. And the people, this is like very important actually, some applications of machine learning. Okay, thank you. So uh, here, uh, some uh, another term which is used a lot: simple coalition games. So a game nu of uh, essential n and nu is simple if for every coalition s, if for every coalition s, uh, either uh, nu of s is equal to one which means that S of S wins, or nu of S is equal to zero. So it is simple. It is essentially the nu value either zero or one. So essentially the same thing that we had it for a voting situation. Uh, often they have this other additional requirement that if S wins, then all supersets of S should also win. So it means that if S equal to one, 
and then for all t which are super uh, sets of s then w of the nu of t should be equal to one this is exactly monotonicity that i mentioned so essentially you said that i mean if a subset wins then any uh, super sets of that should win essentially that's exactly the monotonicity that i have mentioned if uh, that if we have s and t and if s is a subset of t then it means that the uh, uh, here nu of s should be less than or equal to nu of t. S is a subset. This is called monotonicity. So uh, this is an important thing. So these simple games, this does not necessarily imply super additivity. This is exactly the example that I have mentioned. I mentioned that if, if you consider the same voting game, and instead of the rule of 51%, we will put the a rule of 50% to win. In this case, of course, this is a still a simple game because everything is zero or one, but uh, this is not a super additive because of exactly the case that I mentioned, S and T, both of them are disjoint and they are all of them value are one, but then the nu of S union T is, would be one essentially, not two that is required. So uh, the fact that we say it is the game is simple, it means that the value is zero or one, uh, or even even if you add the monotonicity, that does not imply super additivity. And these are important concerns that you should know about them. These, these are the important definitions and things that you need to be able to essentially compare them and understand. What if we have the monotonicity, but we don't have the simplicity? Would it, the monotonicity then imply a super additivity? No. Well, why not? Because like if we remove the simple condition, then a two would be a valid value. Uh, you, this is a good exercise. Actually, you can try to do that. I mean, the uh, uh, super additivity is so that if you are adding to a larger set, the marginal value should be larger compared to the smaller. So that doesn't mean the, just the monotonicity does not imply such kind of things. Uh, okay. It might be a little bit less, uh, more, but not enough to have that conditions essentially. Okay. Yeah, as you said, that'll probably be an exercise for the reader. So. So uh, here, uh, another thing which is important: proper simple games. G is a proper simple game if it is both simple and constant. So it is a proper simple game. It is both simple and constant. So uh, if uh, uh, then uh, what's the meaning of that? It means that if S is a winning coalition, then N minus S should be a losing coalition because it is simple. It means that everything is zero, one. Of course, if it is winning, it means that it is one. Because it is a constant sum, then everything should be essentially equal to one. Then uh, like zero or one. And in this case would be one essentially. So if you consider this case, uh, uh, we know that for s plus nu of n minus nu of s plus nu of n minus s is equal to one. It's a constant sum game. It is essentially equal to one. Uh, in this case, uh, nu of s is equal to one implies that nu of n minus s should be equal to zero. And these are some of these relations. Essentially, with some of them we discuss, and you can I think that would be a good exercise to go through them. We discussed some of them. Some other one are good exercise to check, essentially. But this is a very good set of equations to see that, essentially. The additive games are a subset of super additive games. And these are a subset of, essentially, convex game. Uh, uh, additive games also is a somehow a special case of or subset of constant sum games. Proper simple games, of course, are constant sum games by definition, and proper simple games are simple games again by the definition. These two are by definitions. The other two essentially are coming. Lots of them essentially come by definition or some of the discussion that we had it here. But it's a good exercise to essentially do that. Uh, good. So, so far, everything that we talk, we talk about, we mentioned in the coalition game theory, there are two things which are important. 
One is that, uh, uh, like, what is the payoff? And then here we discuss about the pr different properties of the uh, this characteristic function, no essential or the payoff. So that we can be submodular, supermodular, simple, non-simple, proper, constant sum. All of this was talking about no itself. But what about the other one? That is another, the second aspect that how we should divide the payoff to the grand coalition. That is also important. Because that's the main part actually that makes sure that the game is somehow in some sense fair such that the people are have incentive to join. So, uh, and uh, here uh, again, we are talking about the grand coalition because it's lots of the, I mean, studied games, I mean, it is some of them or a good majority are super additive. And if it is super add additive, we expect that the grand coalition uh, essentially forms because we know that also the grand coalition has the highest payoff. And sometimes we have some kind of thing that the agents may be required to join. For example, some public projects that uh, often legally bound to include all participants. For example, serving in a jury. That is part of the thing that they will put it, that you need to participate there. And if you don't go there, I mean, don't answer it, potentially the judge actually can call you and give you a ticket or something like this. So you need to go there and this is some kind of public thing. So you want to put some kind of payoff that everyone goes essentially and be part of, for example, a jury. So here we are defining this. Uh, so this is the part that we, so so far we talk about the payoff. Now we are going inside that essentially more inside lens into the game. Uh, so here, we, uh, like this is again, the game that we are considering. This is the game. And we want to look at the agent's share in the grand coalition payoff. Okay, the grand coalition gets this one, how much they are paying. As I mentioned, for now we are assuming and we are thinking that the grand coalition forms. Uh, so in the book, I mean, this is the essential the game theory that book, but there are some other things, is uh, defined that essentially uh, like, what is the payoff? So the payoff, the nu of n and v is equal to x is a vector that says x1, how much is the first person gets, x2, how much the second person, and xn is the how much essentially is the nth person get it. But here we are using a simpler, we just mainly use x essentially. x means that essentially how much, uh, like this is the vector of distributions of the payoff among the agents. x1 means that essentially the payoff of the First guy, x to the payoff of the second one, and so on. So these are the important things essentially for the. So we discuss essentially some properties for the nu. Now we are talking some properties for the payoff. So the first thing is the feasible payoff. So what is the feasible payoff? So these are all payoff profile. Whenever we talk about the profile, this is like the same thing. A strategy profile means the vector of all people. So a payoff profiles means that all players, how much they get it. Essentially, the vector x that we talk about. This is the feasible payoff, all payoff profiles that don't distribute more than the worth of the grand coalition. So what's the meaning of that? These are all the vectors that x1 plus x2 plus xn is less than or equal to nu of n. Good. So that, I mean, that's why it's feasible because that's the maximum payoff that we will get it. So that's the one that we can distribute among ranges. Yes? Isn't that, it's not the whole set, it's what's right? This song. Yes, the sum is less than equal. 
Okay, so that uh, uh, that's one definition. The other one is essentially is this one. Uh, and again, we are mainly consider the case that a grand fo coalition forms. So we want to talk about something that a grand coalition forms. I mean, there are some cases that you may discuss other cases, but here we would like to have a grand coalition. So uh, uh, there is another thing it is called pre-imputation set. A pre-imputation set, these are all feasible payoff profiles that are also efficient. What's the meaning of efficient? It means that they distribute the entire worth of the grand coalition among the agents. So here, this is again the same thing that we had it before, like submodularity versus just modularity or additive superadditivity or subadditivity versus additivity. Here, but the difference is that it's a bit different. These are the sum of these that come from game theory because of some background that are there. This is essentially talking about why uh, impute essentially means uh, something it is being done. So here, why do we call it essentially impute? Because it's a, uh, it's a case that we want to make sure that essentially everything is done. That's the concept of impute is done means all the money is gone. So this uh, a pre-imputation set is the one that all feasible ones that are efficient means that we are distributing the whole money among these people. So some of them is equal to New of n. Previous one is just feasible. Now, what about the imputation set? So uh, this is the imputation set is the one that so uh, this is the case that uh, here uh, this is a payoff in which each agent gets at least what he or she gets by going along. What's the meaning of that? It means that here, when we say the imputation set, is that uh, each person individually how much he or she gets it. If he joins this coalition, should be greater than or equal to that one. That's a very I mean, again, uh, some kind of good intuition. This kind of imputations that is important, that if you join here, the, if you join the grand coalition, you will not be worse than you are going along. So that's essentially the idea that Xi should be uh, greater or equal to if you go along. That is, gives you a motivation to, to join the coalition because you know that if I go individually, at least, I cannot get it. Again, this does not necessarily say that the whole coalition forms grand coalition. And these are more conditions that we may need to do it. But at least implies that, I mean, this is some incentive to join to a larger set. In particular, here is the grand coalition. But these are some of the terms, essentially. I mean, these are the game theory, come from game theory thing. Pre-imputation is the feasible plus efficient, and imputation means that essentially excite this one. And again, the, the just I mean, be easy on word. These are some of the things that the people have selected essentially because of the history. <laughs> Don't understand what feasible is trying to say. Like that just looks like that everything is going to be like that. Like by definition. Uh, uh, no, not necessarily. I mean, these are you need to go deeply into each of them. Nothing easily come by definition. Some they may come, but lots of them are not essentially uh, trivial. Wait, then. So, what would be an example where? What would be an example of an infeasible set? I mean, uh, infeasible set is that I mean essentially that uh, like the one that you are getting, you should be greater than the things essentially. Uh, I mean, it might be the case that. Uh, uh, like you may want to, I mean, this one, yeah, you can just say that this is a feasibility, is something it is you, I mean, that one, as I mentioned, that might be the case that you say that, yeah, I only consider feasible game. But yeah, you can essentially think about that you form a coalition, but the money that, this is essentially lots of these startups in some sense. At the beginning, they are just losing money. And they are getting the money, but later they may get some more money. So it is the case that, yes, for some time, this company is actually not only does not produce any money, but loses money. But the idea is that this becomes bigger later, it becomes profitable. 
That's exactly the meaning of a company losing money, essentially. I think I understand, but not entirely, not entirely sure. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, uh, I mean, uh, we can uh, discuss uh, later. I mean, if still some question remains for those things. But uh, let me also mention some another things about fairness. So fairness or symmetry. So uh, as I mentioned, we generally, when we try, this is the whole idea that you want to form a grand coalition. To form a grand coalition, you need to uh, make sure that the gain is fair, essentially. So here we need to define some of these things that are used for fairness. And then next time we will go through this concept of Shapley value and something uh, and similar concept that actually make sure that fairness is possible. So what is a fair division of payoffs? So there are three axioms describing the fairness that I want to talk about. It. Symmetry, dummy player, and additive axioms. Again, these are some definition of fairness. You can have a different definition of fairness and you have more axioms. But these are generally, this is, happens in game theory or other areas, you are defining some important properties. And you want to say that, what is the, uh, how can have these properties all together? And that, for example, here we talk later about the Shapley value is something that can give all of this to us. So let's define the, uh, some, like again, some more definitions. Agent I and J are interchangeable if they always contribute to the same amount to every coalition of the other agents. Good, what's the meaning of that? It means that for every S that contains neither of I or J, then if you add I and, or if you add J, uh, still uh, the new of these two sets would be the same. So essentially I and J are interchangeable because if you add I or J, the same amount it goes on. What about the symmetric uh, axiom? So in a fair division of the payoffs, interchangeable agents should receive the same payments. So now that we have defined the interchangeability of two agents are things. So now we say that, okay, if it is a case, if me and another person are interchangeable, then we should get the same payoff. This is some kind of definition of fair. So we say that if these two are interchangeable, then when you get the payoff, then you should make sure that these guys actually are should get it. Which is again, one concept of payoff. Now, uh, what is the other things that property that we want to have. This is the, another concept is the concept of uh, uh, dummy players. An agent I is a dummy player. If I's contribution to any coalition is exactly the amount that I can achieve alone. What's the meaning of that again? The formula is that for all S that I does not belong to I, to S. Nu of S union i is equal to nu of s plus nu of i. Like this is a dummy essentially that you will add it. It does not add any extra thing. Just add the extra, the value of the guy itself. What is this dummy player axiom? We say that in a fair distribution of payoffs, dummy player should receive payment equal to their amount they receive on their own. So if it is the case that it adds to anything, it just gets the same payoff. Then it means that uh, always the final payoff that he will get it or she will get it should be also equal to its own contribution alone, essentially. <clears throat> Another thing is the additivity. This additivity is different from the one that we talk about it. So we talk about two games. So if you have two games, two coalition games, actually we can define the combined game. What is the, con so we have the, a coalition, two coalition game on the same set of agents, good? So it means that we have the new one and new two, but the same end. So then we can define a combined game. What is a combined game? Is that we can add this game. So that, okay, for each set S, then uh, essentially the payoff that you will get it is the payoff that you will get it for the first one plus the payoff that you will get for this. So this is another thing essentially uh, about the additivity axiom, the third one. 
He said that in a fair distribution of payoffs for G, the agent should get the sum of the one that they videotated in two separate games. So essentially, if there are, if I can, this is my game, this is my coalition game. I can write it as a two separate games by this definition of this. I can write it as a combined things or the addition of two essentially games. If I can write it, then uh, the share that player I get in the z my game, this combined game, should be some of the shares that it gets in the individual. These are the additivity. So these are the three axioms that we will talk about. The, I mean, these are. I mean, these are not written in a stone. These are something that the people have defined as that these are the reasonable things that you have it. But you may, the, the, the definition of fairness is not an easy thing. If you, this is one of the most important things in AI, what's the meaning of fairness? Lots of research essentially in the talking about fairness. And the people define different axioms. And the question is that, I mean, some of them, the people like it more. Why? Because they can get more results out of it. They can essentially build on it and it gives other good properties. But again, no, no definition is written in a stone. In this particular, we talk about this kind of additivity axioms, uh, dummy player axiom, and symmetry axiom. And we say that like we are defining a game, uh, like a division of the essentially this kind of payoff. A fair thing if it has these three properties. And then uh, next time, actually, we talk about Shapley value is the one that you can define essentially uh, this new and you can decide how you divide this money among these people such that the whole result becomes essentially fair according to these three criteria. Good. So uh, one other games also I wanted to say, this is also another thing. Uh, it is called uh, DARPA. Uh, big. Uh, uh, this is another coalition game that actually you may want to know more about it. Uh, DARPA, uh, Red Balloon, challenge. This is another one, actually, it's a very intuitive game and it's an important one. This is another coalition game that you can see. It. The coalition here is not the grand coalition form, but it was important. What is this game? So DARPA, I think it was around 2010 or around that time, at least 10 years ago or something like this. He said, uh, OK, there's some, uh, or maybe a bit later, uh, a bit before. So what was the idea is that we want to find some kind of national security. We need to, I mean, essentially prepare the people for national security if some bad things happen. What was the idea is that at some, say, 10 a.m. this particular day, I think maybe they mentioned what is the day as well. I don't know, day X. We are essentially 10 big red balloons in 10 different places. In US. Go, uh, essentially, 10 different places, 10 big balloons in 10 different places in US, uh, go to air. The first team that finds all these 10 locations or 10 balloons that they went off, that team gets $40,000. Good, this is the thing. Now, that, what was the challenge? Go and create whatever team that you want, whatever mechanism that you want, but the team that gets this, uh, uh, or the first team that gets this one, essentially wins the whole thing. Now, uh, who did win? It, uh, actually, a team from MIT, won the game and got the 40,000. Of course, it was from MIT. Uh, I mean, yeah, it could be a Stanford CMU and could be from UMG. That doesn't mean anything. But uh, there are lots of challenges that others essentially got it. But, but uh, here I want to mention this because this is a very interesting rule. And I want to give, show that this is a little bit different from like the same things. But as I mentioned, nothing is written in stone. You can define fairness in other terms. And here I want to just give you, this is some idea that you can use it in your life. These are some, as I mentioned, game theory or algorithms work in your life, essentially. What was the idea? The idea was very simple. They said that this one, so the people could recruit each other. 
good say that this is a team that we want to form essentially so the people can recruit each other this is free but what was the payment rule here this is what is this one the xi thing that we are talking about this was the uh, and you can read more about it but i just want to give you the main idea the main idea is this one these are 10 balloons we have 40000 so divide uh, 4000 per balloon Now, what is the idea? The idea is this one, that 4,000 per balloon. Now, uh, this is the rule. So you can, I mean, the, you could join essentially to this one and register yourself that, okay, I'm part of this group, etc. And then I'm recruiting these other people because in some sense, we have some kind of hierarchies. This is the first person, maybe this higher, this guy, this other guy, and you need to register somehow in some kind of website that I'm registering this and these are the people. Whenever some new people are coming, say, who recruited me? You have some bus in some sense. Now, what was the idea? The idea is that anyone who finds the, any balloons, so we, now we talk about a different pattern. So this is the first person who gets any balloons, that balloon will be for that person. How much that person gets it? 2,000. So the first person that reports a balloon, that I found this balloon essentially, that person gets uh, half of the price for that balloon. The person who recruited that person, we get how much? 1,000, half of it. The person who recruited that recruiter gets how much? 500. The person who recruited that person gets 250. Anything remaining goes to donation. This sounds like a pyramid scheme, but without the scam. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, you can uh, 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 read essentially more about it, but this is like, I, that was a beautiful idea. And actually, this is something that you can use it. I have designed some other mechanism, use this idea. It's a very nice idea that you can, how you can divide essentially this 4,000 is just give the half of it to the person who found it. The other half goes to the person who recruited this. The other half, of course, to the recruiter of recruiter and so on and so forth. So that was the thing that they got it. And this was like, essentially, they won this game uh, with uh, these things. The only issue about this issue that you can think about it, if I say this is, it is uh, something called it is civil attack, you can read about it. And there are some mechanisms to solve this. What is the civil attack? Is that if I am a recruiter here, and then I I have two essentially personality. That's the meaning of civil attack. So I have recruiter one and recruiter two. That recruiter one essentially hire recruiter two, and both of them are the same person. Then in this case, so for example, here the first person gets uh, here the first person gets the two thousand. Now recruiter two gets one thousand. Recruiter, uh, recruiter two gets 1,000 because that hired this person. But recruiter one, because it hired recruiter two, that person also gets 500. But these two are the same people, essentially. So this person, instead of getting 1,000, it gets, uh, uh, that person gets 1,500. And it can be even more than that. It also, this could be the same. This is called something like civil attack. That uh, civil attack generally means one person essentially comes with different personalities. And you want some mechanisms that are essentially resistant on uh, civil attack. And there are some actually studies after that. There are some papers that you are doing that you can read more about it. So this DARPA uh, red balloon challenge is a very important one. This is the, that was the mechanism. This was essentially the drawback was this concept of essentially civil attack and there are some mechanisms to fix that one. But that's essentially, I mean, at the same time, this kind of recruiter one, if you have some mechanism that I talk for the truthfulness, essentially this is either this is not truthful. How can we make it truthful? Is that if there are some person that physically check their things. So recruiter one and recruiter two, if they need to upload their passport things or some IDs, then they cannot be the same person because everyone can do that. This is always, as I mentioned, sometimes the price of essentially making, the way to make something truthful is that you use some kinds of physical checks. That's it. And then we will continue next time with Shapley value and fairness. Do you guys have